I have to forewarn my slides are not as pretty, so it's just a whole bunch of text. No, thank you. That's why I apologize. Hello, uh, I'm Steve, and today I'm going to be talking about fetch. How many people have heard about fetch? You know what fetch is? Fantastic. All right, so it should be a really good time. Ask me questions at any point during this presentation. I'll be sure to answer the questions you have. If I know the answer, that is. Uh, okay, so fetch is awesome, and my goal here is to make sure that I can and some also everyone to start using fetch uh, in production, probably if you can. And I'll also go with why it's awesome, how you can use it today, and in some cases why it's not so awesome. So as um, uh, my name is Steve, and I work at Dell. I'm a software engineer there. I primarily work on the UI, but sometimes I do Java and service layer. Uh, work with our folks to create APIs, make sure that we're getting nice APIs in mind. And in the future, hopefully, we'll get to use GraphQL and be able to get rid of the whole system. Has anyone used GraphQL? Has anyone used GraphQL? No. Yeah. It's, it's really nice. If you haven't read up on it, it's not part of the stock, but if you haven't read up on it, GraphQL is really awesome and makes great things. A nice game. Okay, so um, as I was going through preparing these slides, um, I like listening to JS Java at the Web Platform Podcast. And Jeff Hussain is one of our, I think I have a nine hundred Jeff Hussain. He's, he's really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Uh, it's, if, if you hadn't heard any talks from him, Jeff Eason is a pretty good one. He sits on the TC Development Committee and he's a UI architect at Netflix. But so the reason I have this up here is because so many times you hear people say, well, I don't want to use CS6, so ES6 seems like it's just syntactic sugar, or oh, what does it really exist today, and what I can do in ES5. But that's not really the case. In some situations, yes, I can see why that may be perceived as such. But uh, syntactic sugar is awesome. Everyone loves sugar. It's a uh, way to make it And he doesn't like sugar. Blaine doesn't like sugar. But uh, <laughs> sugar is great because uh, when you are able to be productive, you can do a lot more things. When you're able to reason about uh, productivity, you can do a lot more things. So I tend to like syntactic sugar myself. I'll use it whenever I can. And I think it just uh, brings up a level of understanding of the code for anything that we just have to talk about the ability of code. But if none of you listen to JS Java or the web podcast, I do recommend them a really, really great podcast and you guys should Now, before I continue, uh, there are a few caveats. So don't jump into using fetch if you meet any one of these uh, caveats. So browser support, Chrome, Firefox, and Opera, you know, the usual standards. Uh, IE, it's on modern of IE, because the pages can go to you to go and see what features are being implemented, whether it's CSX features, DOM3 features, CSS3 features. Um, it's basically a way for you to see whether I supports it or not. Right now, it's in the consideration status, so it's not yet available, and they're considering it. So Edge is not going to have Fetch as a native, but hopefully the next version after Edge. And since it's an evergreen browser, of course, we should come up with soon. But all the other browsers do uh, support it. Safari, not so much. We'll see whenever Safari 9 comes out, or Safari 10. The next caveat is that Fetch requires that you have a polyfill. So, um, is everyone here for the polyfills and what they are to do? The browser? Great. Um, so, it assumes that you have promises in the browser. If you don't have promises that need to be available, it also assumes that you can bring in promises if you have a library. And the library has to be able to expose the promises construction and the global scope. If it's not there, it's going to fail. So, that's a big caveat. Uh, is everyone here familiar with promises and what they are to do? Fantastic. Right. I don't have to go over very much. Uh, and the next big one, which is probably the uh, biggest example when it comes to fetch, is that you cannot cancel a fetch request. So can you abort fetch request just yet? And it comes to the nature of promises, right? You cannot, well, at least the way the information today, you cannot go ahead and cancel the promise. Once the promise is up, it's an asynchronous function. Uh, once it's complete, it's complete. If it's not complete, there's no one to abort it. You can do some snazzy things, but that's not really the concept of promises and how you're supposed to be able to use them. And then last but not least, uh, there is no proper support yet. And you notice the promises uh, in terms of canceling and aborting. I said yet. It's, if you go to the mailing list for Chrome and Firefox, and the mailing list for Fetch for the Fetch site itself, and for promises, they are trying to bring in support for you to be able to abort or to cancel promises and to have progress support as well. Uh, does anyone use progress as far as SAFs are here today? No? Okay. Uh, you'll use progress normally. An example of using progress would be 
if you are uploading a file or if you're making a, some type of request to a server that's far, far, far away, and you want to provide the user some way to be able to say, all right, here's how many percentages you are complete, you actually get statuses back from your SHR file. So that's what uh, the progress support is all about. Okay, so let's jump into all Facebook. Can everyone see the code? It should be good. So here's how you normally construct uh, an XML HTTP request. Back in the days, for those of us that remember having to support ID6, we had to check, hey, is XML HTTP request available? If it's not available, go ahead and check for the ActiveX object, and then go through your rigmarole of saying, all right, now I need to open, specify my method, specify my URL, and specify whether or not it's async. So this true, I don't have to ask. This, always leave it to true, to never, ever, 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 ever set uh, async to false. Sending to false essentially blocks you when it's really, really, really terrible practice. Uh, and then XHR on rate state change, so you, you generally that's what you can subscribe to. Right? You can specify a function to say, hey, notify me when I've changed my rate state. You've got one through four for rate state. So one saying, I, I'm finally opened by XHR, and then two, three, I'm in progress, and four, yes, everything is finally ready. Uh, and then the timeout, you can specify a timeout uh, to say, hey, if my request doesn't come back in this amount of milliseconds, go ahead and cancel the request. And then your typical unload, unerror, un progress, and finally get you the certain function. So all of this just to go ahead and say, I want to go ahead and fetch some uh, fetch data from the GitHub API and just be able to see this data. You have to construct all of this. This is how we used to do it and how developers are used to using the XHR object. Well, then again, the whole idea of developer affordance and syntactic sugar. So when jQuery came along, they're like, yeah, you know what? It's kind of garbage that developers have to do this. Well, if you have a function, that you've normally used in the past to say, I want to copy paste this function, and this function is going to be responsible for creating my SHR. I'll pass in a URL and maybe a sentence object, and they will construct everything for me. Well, developer for this makes it much, much nicer and much easier to be able to say, you know what? If we provide everyone a nice way to be able to, uh, or expose a nice API that allows you to do essentially the same thing without exposing all of the nastiness, uh, a lot more people will get to use it. Hence the popularity of uh, jQuery, especially jQuery agents. So here's an example of the get function in uh, jQuery, you get to do the same things as I specified before. You can specify an error handler, you can specify success, timeout, and then outside of, um, uh, you can also chain a done, and a success, and an error, and a catch function as well, again, and a final uh, As of jQuery 3.0, which is just an alpha phase, I'm an OSS junkie, so I tend to stay on the leading edge of a lot of things that are coming out, but in the next version of jQuery, you will be able to actually supply a settings object as opposed to what you can do today, which is just supply your problem and use get. Uh, or if you have amazing confidence in your API in the server that, hey, my server is always going to be up, you can just use the JSON, and of course, this assumes that your API is written in JSON and you don't assume any issues with the JSON that's being returned. So, again, developer affordance is making sure that um, you don't have to worry about constructing and saying, hey, I forgot to hit send, and why is this not sending my SHR, or why, why, why is stuff not working? Developer affordance, I'm a big, big advocate for it. Um, yes, there is a limit in terms of what you should do and what you can do, but where it paves the way and makes it easy for people to understand, I'm always all for it. So, um, let's talk about the good parts of what jQuery and it's not just jQuery, right? You've got a Dojo API also has some extra charms available. So, Dojo and jQuery kind of uh, dictated out Yahoo UI came at, at some point and tried to come to the same space. Of, uh, making sure that you can have a nice and easy way to be able to expose an SHR. But the good part, so it sounds generally good practices. So people know that, hey, you know what, if I need to go ahead and fetch some JSON, fetch some data, I know I can do dollar sign dot get, or if you're hardcore, you can still go ahead and construct your SHR project. But pretty much nowadays, if you ask people, hey, I need you to make an HX call to get fetching some data, a lot of people are going to assume jQuery in the browser and they're going to say everything's all good. Uh, it's made SHR accessible to the masses, so people coming from the server side can kind of sort of understand this by looking at the jQuery API uh, and say, all right, in order to be able to send this, all I have to do is uh, uh, dot get and be able to specify URL, and that's pretty much all I have to do. So again, it makes things a little bit easier to be able to reason about. And then, like I was mentioning before, no, like, hey, I forgot to invoke the send function, so that's probably the reason why I spent the last 10 minutes trying to figure out what this bug is, with my code and not actually sending my message on. But similarly, we also have a bad box. So one of the Terrible things is that it's not chainable, right? So it doesn't matter what it is that you're doing, um, your SHR, at least the native SHR, is not chainable. Likewise, uh, if you are using jQuery, it's not going to be chainable as well. And uh, chainable in the sense that uh, if you're using promises, you can do some really nice things that I want to show you here in just a little bit. Uh, and then defers uh, in jQuery, please, please don't use the jQuery 
It's terrible, it's horrible, it sucks. Uh, don't use it, avoid it as much as possible, just import it in the promises library, and you should be good to go. So can we improve the ergonomics of right? So we've gone through figuring out what it looks like to form a guitar back in the old days, uh, what jQuery brings along to us, and uh, there are some libraries that exist today that have taken a look and said, you know what, even the way that jQuery does it is not easy enough, it's not streamlined. So for those of you that have ever programmed in Node, you might have come across um, SuperAgent. SuperAgent is a wrapper over the names of XHR, the you is both in Node and inside of your browser. It's uh, created by the folks at Vision Media. I think TJ Holloway Chuck was the one who originally created it. But it gives you some nice chainability to where you can say, I want to create a new XHR object. So you specify a URL, and then you can set your request headers, you can specify a whole bunch of things, but the whole idea is, um, jQuery inspired to where you're returning an instance of the item that you've just created. So that way you can chain by saying do this and then dot get, dot get, dot get, and then finally dot end to be able to send your request. Uh, request is also another very nice library. We actually use request in production at Gallup. Uh, and again, server side or uh, client side, request pretty much the same thing as super agents. It affords you to be able to do a lot of nice things, uh, exposes some high level APIs so you don't have to worry about dealing with the low level aspects of uh, creating an SHR. And then promise wrapped, we also uh, use an implementation of promise wrapped library. Right? So what we do, uh, one of the things we'll do at Gallup is uh, we like the idea of being able to return a promise and throwing around promises to different functions and then finding, just making it appear as if we're dealing with asynchronous pro uh, synchronous programming as opposed to asynchronous programming. Uh, despite what a lot of people say, yes, uh, some may grow up asynchronous programming very easily, but a lot of people really have a difficult time with it. So, Promises try to solve that in a very nice fashion to be able to provide a synchronous way to do things. So what we do, we wrap the jQuery object, and then we just return back a promise, and then eventually, once we get our data back, it's resolved, and we're good to go, and you can deal with promises, and you can continue to change those promises, and return new promises as you go along. So it's made the API for us a lot easier and a lot nicer to have to deal with. Um, again, this is all about improving the ergonomics of our developers on our team, and making sure that things are easy to deal with. All right, so that's all the old stuff in XHR. Does anyone have any questions before I move along? Nope. Okay. So um, enough history, let's talk about Fetch. So Fetch, there's a new proposal that came about last year. So it's been available for about a year behind the uh, a beta flag inside of Chrome. I believe it was Chrome 39 that initially introduced Fetch. But when it was introduced, it was introduced inside of web workers, and web workers, well, that's another story for a different day. But the three primary, if you take a look at the spec for Fetch, there are three primary parts to Fetch. There's a, a request object, a response object, and then there's an actual global Fetch function itself. And then, uh, optionally, I like to include these as the other two that are not really spearheaded. But you've got headers, and then you've got streams. Um, does everyone know what streams are? Has people played with streams? Okay, fantastic. So, you know, okay. So think of a stream as just incremental data. At the end of the day, it's as simple as just incremental data. Uh, if you want to read a, a file from the file system, in Node, for example, uh, you can have a synchronous way of doing it, which is really bad. I don't advocate people doing that unless you need to have some type of log. Or you can say, hey, you know what? I want to read my file async. And then as it's reading the file being sync, it's going to give you a chunk of data. You can also specify, I think, the size of the chunk of data that you're getting in. But as you're getting in this chunk of data, there's a whole notion of incremental data. Um, you can choose to do whatever it is that you want with it. And it exposes some really powerful mechanisms that you can use that so I'll uh, go ahead and talk about here in a little bit when I go the response object. But uh, that's why you don't recommend using synchronous file operations. Flogging. I don't like anything that blocks. Once you start dealing with asynchronous behavior, it's very difficult to get to anything that's blocked. Now, don't get me wrong, there are scenarios where you absolutely want it to block. You don't want any other operation to proceed, but uh, I generally don't recommend it. Uh, the node docs will try to steer you as far away as possible from doing a synchronous read of the file and always uh, tell you to do an asynchronous read of the file. You just want to avoid blocking. That's what makes it more fast. Why do you want to avoid blocking? What's that? Why do you want to avoid blocking? Well, if you block, nothing else can be done, right, uh, inside of your bundle. So that's the primary reason why you don't want to block. Similarly to why you don't want to block on the UI as well. Nothing else can happen at a time that's blocking. Now, yes, Node does make a lot of nice interesting things to you. But one of the things that folks will know, Node really, it does, it has, it has threads in it, right? So it has to talk to the file system in a specific way. 
And there are threads that have what lifted as mixed threads, if anyone gets familiar with that implementation. But the threads in any, they're just hidden from you, and you don't have to interact with them. You just interact with the one loop and say, here's what I want to do. Node deals with the uh, classes and descriptors and deals with the classes to say, all right, now I need to go ahead and grab a thread, go ahead and read something and do what it is that you need to do. Blocking uh, means that you essentially lose something when you block, right? It's not available for you, and the pool is, I'll get into it. Uh, it in a little bit later, because I have another section that actually talks about blocking. I'm almost at the 15 minute mark, so I'll get into it in a little bit later. Oh, I can talk to you after this. Okay, so the header object. So normally, uh, when you're creating an SHR object, you get to specify that, hey, um, now that I've done new XML HTTP requests, let me go ahead and do my set request header. And then you can specify the headers that you want to be able to send along with SHR. Uh, the header in the new flex spec allows you to say, you know what, uh, there are some forbidden things that you cannot do anymore from a security perspective uh, that you should be setting and that you're forbidden from setting. So if you want to use fetch, uh, header is a nice way to be able to say, I'm going to throw a whole bunch of things to this, uh, to the constructor of this uh, uh, header, and it will return to me and properly instantiate an object, but for anything that is not valid or anything that is blocked or anything that is considered forbidden, it will just check out for you and then you there are some really bad cases to that, and I'm currently discussing whether or not you uh, it errors out if you provide headers that are forbidden, such as trace, or if you just silently ignore those and just set them forward. So it's debatable right now in terms of what is going to be the better approach to show you errors, which might show you errors. Um, and then the other thing is it's not required for invoking fetch. There are some sensible defaults that are assumed for you. So you don't have to necessarily specify this. It's just a safeguard for you to be able to say, I want to create a headers object. This is what I want to set. Um, and there are tons and tons and tons of different options that you can set as far as your headers. Uh, and we'll get into some of those here in a little bit in terms of what you can set. And then the request object. So this is what you actually provide to fetch. Again, this is not required for you to construct. You can construct a request object, and inside of your request object, you can say, here is my URL, here is my method. Uh, do I want to handle ports? Do I want to do all these wonderful and amazing things? It's not required for you to do so, but if you want to have the opportunity to find when and fine tune and get away from the defaults, you can specify a request object inside of fetch. Uh, so it accepts a settings object, and in the settings object, you can specify your URL, you can specify your headers, you can specify whether or not you want to do course pre flight. Uh, the last one, custom course pre flight, is actually a big deal because previously, uh, if you've ever taken a look at your console when you try to do a, a course request and your server, or the server that you send the post request to does not actually support post requests, you notice that there's a request that goes out initially, an options head. You say, hey, um, server, do you actually uh, allow me to be able to send a post request to you? And the server can respond and say, no, I don't allow you to do anything, I'm not allowed, and then you'll send you back uh, Here, with requests, you can actually switch and say, no, browser, I don't want you to send a post request because it's a waste of time. I know that my server already supports it. So you can actually have a lot of fine way control over what it is that you want to do. And then um, you can also specify things like headers, priority, etc. Should I have a question? Oh, okay. Why don't you raise your hand? And then uh, you can, oddly enough, also construct a response object. Uh, it's not odd. If you've ever worked with uh, service workers, you know that inside of a service worker, you can say, hey, I want you to be able to do this blog of work. But once you're done with this blog of work, I need for you to be able to return this to me. Traditionally, you just uh, serialized into a string, which is really expensive, and then finally send it up to your window context. With a request and the way that fetch is supposed to work between the web a worker context and the window context, you can actually just send the response back as is without having to serialize your data that you send back. So massive performance boom. If you've ever used web workers, you know that one of the disadvantages is the small serialization process. If you're sending a small data packets back and forth, that's fine. Uh, your UI is not going to be blocking while you're doing processing, but if you have a large enough object that's deep in that you could run into some trouble with some other forms there. Uh, so a response object, uh, it mutates over time, and the reason it mutates over time is because the results that you get in back that is the response object is a stream. So we talked about streams and what streams are, and stream is an incremental, uh, incremental data stream, or just incremental data, if you will. Okay, so finally we get to the global fetch function. So this is the function that you invoke, and it takes one of three things, right? So you can just provide a string and say, hey, here's a string, go ahead and fetch me data with the string. And you can assume some reasonable defaults for you. Uh, or you can say, here's a URL, uh, here's a string, and here's a settings object. In your settings object, you can specify whether you want to pre-flight, you want cores, you want headers, all these variety of options you can specify there. And then 
Finally, you can just say, you know what, here's a request object, I've constructed it, and I'm good to go. The nice thing about the request object is, both request, response, and fetch, once you've constructed these objects, and once you've used them, that's it. You can't do anything to them anymore. You can't use them in another request anymore. So that has advantages and disadvantages, but we want to get into it. And most importantly, before I change on to the next slide, it returns a cross. So that is the biggest advantage of fetch today over all of the other implementations, is that natively, it's going to return a promise to you that you can throw around and deal with as if it's a synchronous operation. Okay, so here's fetch in action. Um, so we just have a couple of healthy contents here. I have one that says expect and one that says get JSON. So what we're doing, we're first saying, here's my URL. I'm going to specify that I want to go ahead and grab uh, some issue events from the GitHub API, which is open. You don't have to be authenticated. And then the response that I get back that I'm expecting is a stream. So I can choose to say if the status of my stream is 200, uh, go ahead and just return the response. Now notice I'm not mutating the stream yet. Uh, you can the stream that you get back has several functions on it that allow you to mute it. So I don't think we'll be able to deal with reactive programming or reactive extensions. Um, again, from Jeff and he's got a really, really, really good video to cast on uh, on reactive programming. But the idea is that you can transform the stream as it's coming in and be able to do some pretty amazing and pretty awesome things. But, but that's what these two functions are doing. They just help functions. And then um, um, going through my table, uh, passing in the function, it constructs the data that I want, and then keep on going down the line, and then eventually I have a catch. And that's pretty much the gist of what a fetch looks like. All right, so there was a lot, a lot of stuff going on in there. Let's go ahead and decompose it just a little bit. So how those, uh, as I said previously, the inspect is taken in the stream, we're just taking the status. You can check a wide variety of things. So the things that you used to today was checking on the jQuery object or the SHR object, you can go ahead and continue to check. And then you can throw an error. The cool thing about promises is that when you throw an error, it's not bubbled up, but instead it's passed on down to any handlers that are able to handle this error. Uh, you will also notice that these functions, uh, helpers that I'm creating, don't have an error handle or an error callback. Normally, when you're dealing with promises, they'll say, hey, provide me a success callback and provide me an error callback. That is fraught with so many issues because so many people tend to forget that depending on your return type from a venable or from a promise, you can run into some very interesting issues where you get the notion of my error has been swallowed, right? It's gone. So that's if you search for error has been swallowed in promises, it's a very common thing that happens because um, if you don't have, if you assume that the next venable is going to handle that error for you, you just have a mistake. That's not going to be handled for you. You always want to make sure that you specify a catch, and that's something that we've tried to propagate on our team at Gallup is always make sure that when you're dealing with promises, always have a catch, specify a catch, and that catch will be guaranteed to catch any errors that are thrown at any point during the stack. Again, big component of promises, I love promises. Um, and then get JSON is just, here's one of the help functions that's available on the screen. So you can say, all right, now that I have my data, I can just do a to JSON to it. Now, again, the cool thing is, this is also returning a promise. So once you say to JSON, uh, it's going to wait until your status is, uh, your ready status is going to be four. And of course, assuming that you have a 200 status at the top, but once you have the entirety of your data, then you can find and say, all right, I'm going to start a JSON object, and then I'm going to find a ship to you. You also have available to you a new text, where you can do two blob, or you can do an array buffer in front of you, some very interesting things. And then the implication, here you, as I mentioned before, you can specify a URL, or you can say, hey, you know, let me go ahead and construct a request object, provide a URL, and provide some settings if you want, and then go ahead and call the fetch object, the fetch function, with the request object. Then, then finally, the handlers. So this is typical of Venable. So when I say you can do some really cool stuff uh, with streams, one of the implementations that I've seen, so um, WebM is a video format that Google released uh, a while back. It was supposed to take the world over by storm, but it never ended up taking the world over by storm. But it's not implemented in a wide variety of process. So what you can do if you are uh, crazy enough, or clever enough, if you will, because you're getting back a stream, you can actually apply a transform to the byte data that you're getting back and be able to transform it into, or encode it rather, into the format that you expect a WebM player to expect, and be able to actually play the video stream as it's coming in. So you can come in as MP4, and you can transcode it on the fly, because it's a stream that's coming in, in incremental data, and you can spit it out as WebM. Or likewise, if you want to, there's actually a polyfill for PNG2. If your browser does not support PNG2, you can do the same thing. I've got some byte stream data that's coming in, apply a transformer to it, and then finally you get out your PNG, and then you can write it to file with your know, that's whatever it is that you want to do. But you can do some really cool things when you start dealing with streams in the browser. And that's one of the benefits of uh, fetching API as opposed to SHR, because SHR assumes that you're going to have the entirety of your data in memory, 
and be able to construct and deal with that data once it's in memory. And that's really expensive. And then uh, here, we're just, uh, again, using those helper functions to say, inspect it, make sure that everything's OK. And then I've got my JSON, this one transforms into JSON. And then we're just using some ES goodness here to say, hey, uh, make sure that the data is just defaulted to an empty object if uh, I don't get anything that satisfies me, or if I don't get any data back and I forget to be available, and then you can do whatever it is that you want here. One of the benefits, too, when I was talking about chainable before and saying that this is not uh, jQuery for us and not chainable, or even SSR is not chainable, is that if you are returning a hypermedia document, Right. as part of your request that you made to your API, you can then begin to traverse that hypermedia document, it's kind of like what crawlers do, right? You can traverse that hypermedia document and be able to say, hey, do I see any hyperlinks? If you see any hyperlinks, go ahead and construct another fresh object and continue to return promises and continue to go that way until you finally reach the end of the stream and you've traversed the entirety of your hypermedia object. So there are a wide variety of things that you can do with promises and just being able to continuously change it and go along and progress along in that fashion. And then lastly, as I was talking about before, catching errors, always make sure if you're dealing with promises, specify catch. It doesn't harm anything, it doesn't hurt anything. Um, if you return a type error from anywhere within one of your identifiers, uh, you should be able to construct a type error object that you can say, hey, I'm at this point in my promise chain, and here's a message for you, and here's a line number where it happened. And then finally, this is the last slide I promised. The song course. So previously, I mentioned that you've got some interesting issues, right, with cores that you're dealing with, with the whole notion of pre flight chain, setting an options header, and then there's sort of fine what's on the back. Um, but there are some limitations. It's not glorious space here. So your server still has to support cores. It still has to be able to send back a header saying, yes, I support this method to be, uh, for you to create this method, and I support your IP, I support your domain, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the response must not be okay, which means that it has to specifically say that, yes, I do support these things. And some of the options that you can set um, in, within inside of your request header is saying, all right, I only want to be able to make sure that I'm sending requests of the same origin. If you, if someone tries to modify or well, some tries to do a man and uh, attack and modify the request while it's being sent, uh, this header is guaranteed that once you construct a fetch object, um, once you construct sorry, a request object, you cannot edit it anymore. And once it's in use, you cannot change it. So you can only specify that, yes, this is only going to go to this specific origin and cannot be used. Uh, likewise, post with force pre flights, you can specify that no, I want to pre flight, I don't want to send an options header, I just want to be able to say get in my data because I already know that it supports it. Or you can specify no post header to say, yeah, forget about post and you're good to go. Now, there are tons more features available. I am only touching uh, just the surface area, but there are tons, tons, tons more features available. And finally, specs. I'm a specs junkie, I read specs first before I can go to implementations. Um, if you want to find out more about Fetch and what it deals with, what it's like, and streams and SHR, I actually started from bottom up, so I never actually looked at the SHR spec because I never, I never needed to, but you get to learn a lot of interesting stuff that um, you otherwise would have never thought about using, and um, I feel like by, by reading the specs, you also get to develop empathy for the computer, and it's a reverse role, which is not weird, but uh, you tend to know how to use things properly, and anticipate problems before they can happen. Uh, fetch streams, these two are ratified. So streams and XHR are ratified. Fetch is still in progress. If you want to join up for mailing this, you should be able to see it at the fetch aspect of what's going to do that org. And questions. Think 27 minutes. There we go. Yes, sir. Show those URLs again. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. How does it prevent a request from being changed in flight? If I said that, uh, that word. Uh, you can, well, programmatically, you cannot change it. If you go to the console and construct an object, you want it, it doesn't allow you to change that object. Once you constructed it, that's it. Sure, but I mean, once it's in flight in the web server. Well, that's, sorry, once it's in flight to the web server, then yeah, I it's kind of scoop there. If someone is ingenious enough to be able to capture that for you. So, so, so what is the use case for that? Um, the use case is not shooting yourself in the foot, mostly locally. All right. so that's, that's mostly the use case. Yeah. Yeah. But they sell it differently by saying, yes, so you know, it's a build attack. So I was trying to come up with a scenario where. Um, yeah, uh, once, once it's left in the chain, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. That's what I expected. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think. Any other uh, questions? It's really cool. Um, oh, and I forgot. The reference implementation that everyone is using right now is GitHub's implementation of Fetch. So if you go to GitHub, right now, GitHub.com slash uh, GitHub slash fetch. You'll be able to see the reference implementation. It's really cool that they only, 
As I mentioned previously in the slide before, if you have to support IE8 or IE9 to get a bottle, don't even use it because it's not going to work too hard for you. You have to first support a promises library. Unless you use promises already and you're using a library that um, exposes a global promise function, it's not worth it to use if you're using those options. So. What about support streams? Uh, streams, so modern.ie.org uh, is going to be IE Edge Plus. So Edge actually has, will have support for streams. Uh, Chrome 40, the current version of Chrome does, I don't know when it was introduced. Um, same thing with Opera, because Opera uses the WebKit rendering engine and Blink. Uh, sorry, the, yeah, it uses WebKit and Blink, the rendering engine. And then Firefox, they do support it. I, I think Firefox was actually the first one to support streams. It was just behind a flag, and you just had to enable it. But yeah, IE again is going to be the uh, part of the kit. Safari, okay, so Safari is interesting. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, sometimes I feel like Safari is a crap because it's, it's WebKit based, but um, they're really slow to adapt a lot of changes and a lot of new features. Uh, so I'm not sure whether streams are supported in Safari or not. I do have Mac, which is kind of crazy. I should know this. But I'm not sure if they're supported or not in Safari. They're on WebKit, so I would assume that unless it does something wonky, that they should support streams. They're a Chrome Cloud WebKit. I mean, well, didn't they fork it? Right, they use a blank for the rendering engine. That is what they use, yeah. Is streams fully standardized? What's that? Is streams fully standardized? Fully? Yeah, I don't feel like the spec was fully standardized yet, so Safari so doesn't implement it's, anything that's so, not like fully done. Yeah, so um, you've got uh, three stages, right, for standardization. You've got stage zero, which is, hey, this is crazy, bananas, fans, don't use this unless you are really, really, really adventurous. Then stage one, stage two, and then stage three is finally um, good to go. It's right now at stage two. If you take a look at Node and RGS, it's pretty much saying it's ready. It just needs to be uh, better for, uh, better for. But you can use it in production. Let's say we use streams in production, so you could do that. What kind of cool examples could you do with this? I can think of your head and look at this and say, well, I can make a player or something. The transforms are really cool. So, like I said, you're going to do some pretty amazing things. I know one of the earlier players in Netflix uh, actually used the notion of getting a byte stream back and being able to transcode that byte stream on the fly and then being able to, uh, I forget the exact specifics of what it was, but it ended up being an MP4 from what the original source content was. But from my perspective, what, what excites me the most is, again, just developer affordance. It makes it much, much easier and much, much nicer to have native support for you to have a nice way to construct uh, this in HS for a simple network request. Now, the other thing that I didn't mention too is that uh, fetch is going to be the underlying mechanism that's going to be used for basically any type of network request. Uh, so, whether it's um, you're loading a style sheet, right, it's like your DOM, if it's loading an image, if it's loading a script tag, they're all going to be using the underlying primitive, which is going to be fetch. Right now, it's being used as SHR with some limitations, but once fetch is verified, that definitely is going to be using fetch in order to. So it makes it really nice because then uh, some blocky things go away. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, yes. I, I never thought I'd hear myself say these words, but what was the name of your man crush again? I didn't get it right. Oh, uh, <laughs> his name is uh, Jeff Hussein, and he's the lead UI architect at Netflix. J A F F A R. U the H U S E Yeah. But yeah, if, he he's really cool, extremely energetic. Um, he explains things really, really well. I've learned a lot to start listening and watching this video. So he's one of the devs in Yeah, um, so they have a recent project called Falkor that's gonna be doing some really, really awesome things when it comes to data access. Uh, I'll probably do a presentation on that once it's out in a while, but Falco is really, really it's kind of along the lines of what GraphQL and Facebook are trying to do, which is flipping the head in terms of what, what it means when you design a new app. So instead, as long as you are server side, this is the implementation that Facebook has. And I think they also have a reference implementation too. But the idea is that you, as long as your server side speaks a certain language, which is GraphQL, I can send a JSON object from the client, and I can specify exactly what I want that JSON object to look like. No changes need to be done on the server side because it will understand the structure of JSON object form. So then you can start doing some interesting things like instead of getting the entirety of the payload, like you would when you're just fetching a resource off a person with an ID one. You can then say, you know what, 
I just want a snippet of that resource that says ID1, just go ahead and give me these constructs and I'm good to go. But your backend people or your source side people don't have to go and say, all right, now I need to write a new endpoint for you, I need to uh, get a new resource for you, and I need to finally formulate out what you need. Know, so uh, GraphQL, there are several reference implementations right now, but it's really cool if you uh, get a chance to play. Thanks, Steve. Yeah.